Good afternoon. You're watching Concordia News. I'm Christina Kozakiewicz. And I'm Chris McLean. Winter appears to be over, but not everybody is enjoying the nice weather. Concordia University is currently at the negotiating table. The part-time faculty and support staff have been trying to get a new contract for six years. As negotiations drag on, Brett Bundale looks at how this could affect students. Many of the classes here at Concordia University are taught by part-time faculty, but they've been working without a contract for the last six years. Maria Peloso is the president of the Concordia University Part-Time Faculty Association. She hopes that a deal will be hammered out soon, but says, given the university's track record, she's not expecting much. I mean, we're dealing with a great deal of instability, a great deal of contradiction, a great deal in conflict. I mean, we have no president, we have no provo, we have no director of human resources. Um, there's no one to handle grievances. Um, stemming from the collective agreement we have, you shouldn't be surprised to know that this inevitably will have an impact at the bargaining table when you're trying to negotiate a collective agreement. Support staff at Concordia are also at the negotiating table. According to Union President André Legault, the university is dragging its feet over wage increases, the subcontracting of work and other grievances. The previous contract, which is still in effect, uh, expired August 31st, 2002. Uh, so it's been about five and a half years that we've been without a contract. Negotiations between the university and the unions continue to inch forward. But if no agreements are reached soon, the unions may consider stepping up pressure tactics. However, the university hopes to avoid any escalation by reaching an agreement as quickly as possible. Tanya Churchmuch is the Senior Media Relations Advisor at Concordia. She says labour negotiations are going well and should be resolved soon. It's unfortunate that things have gone on for as long as they have and that's why we are working uh, with the unions right now to do our best to negotiate a contract as soon as possible. But we're angry now. We've had enough. That's our motto. Enough is enough. Basta. Basta. Despite a mandate to strike, Concordia's part-time faculty continue as usual. But if no agreement is reached soon, students may feel the effects of the labor dispute before the end of the semester. Brett Bundale, Concordia News, Montreal. Brett Bundale is live at Concordia's downtown campus. Brett, can you give us an update on how the negotiations are going? Well, Christina, the support staff union has reached an agreement with the university, but the part-time faculty are still at the negotiating table. Now, even though they have had a mandate to strike since last fall, the union was hesitant to use it. But last Monday, part-time faculty did finally decide to go on strike. Now, as you can see behind me here, they are protesting outside of the hall building. They'll also be meeting with the university. Now, although Concordia says they'd like to reach a settlement as quickly as possible, so far, none of the union's demands have been met. Christina? Thanks, Brett. That was Brett Bundale reporting. German inventor Rudolf Diesel imagined his namesake engine running off of vegetable oil, not fossil fuels. But Diesel went overboard, literally. He drowned on his way to England in 1913, and history, as we know, took another direction. Now, a garage in Little Italy is converting car engines in the original spirit of Diesel. Kai Nagata has this story. There's something fishy going on at Eco Auto. All the cars that leave this garage smell faintly of frying calamari. Mark Amsden was a mechanic at Volkswagen for over 20 years. Now he's perfected a system that allows any diesel vehicle to run off of straight vegetable oil. Uh, just pump it out. It for about $2,500, Amsden and mechanic Colin Burnett will install a secondary tank in the back of your car. You still need diesel to start the engine, but then the warm oil can be sucked through a filter and injected right into your pistons. The conversion pays for itself in a matter of months, and it's part of a growing trend toward biofuels, which are cheaper than petroleum and easier on the atmosphere. The Montreal Transit Corporation has been running a 5% biodiesel blend in their buses since November, but that fuel comes from rendered animal fat and has to go through a chemical process to become diesel. Eco Auto System runs right off of waste restaurant oil. Amsden gets his grease from a local seafood restaurant, hence the smell. They don't have to pay for disposal and he doesn't have to pay for gas, so everyone wins, even Mother Nature. You're not pulling, you know, oil out of wherever, out of the tar sands, you're using waste oil and I mean a vehicle that runs good, you know, you're using 5% diesel, 95% vegetable oil. Of course, canola cars require a certain initiative on the part of their owners. 
but Colin Burnett figures it's worth it. Uh, I think it requires a little more effort from everybody if we're really going to change our consumption patterns and if we're really going to do anything that's going to improve the environment. People are going to have to make a little more effort here and there, whether it's buying recycled toilet paper or going and getting your oil out of a restaurant. It's a small step, but Rudolf Diesel would be pleased. And with all the poutine joints around, this idea could definitely gain momentum. Kai Nagata, Concordia News, Montreal. Biofuels were supposed to be a magic bullet, a clean, renewable energy source with zero carbon output. Now we're told that ethanol is responsible for everything from skyrocketing food prices to environmental degradation. Kai Nagata is back with the Mad Minute. Farmers burning jungle to grow fuel crops, tortilla rides and pasta protests, and what do we hear is to blame? Biofuels. Okay, wait a second. Most of the world's carbs come from rice and wheat. Those are not fuel crops. But like a lot of things these days, the price ain't right. So what gives? Well, with gas over a buck twenty-six at the pump, producing and transporting any kind of food is getting pricey. Droughts are not caused by biofuels, but weird weather is caused by our fossil fuel fixation. Second point, soy and corn are going into ethanol production instead of into people's mouths. But guess who else competes for those exact same crops? Livestock. North America has a cow, man, for every three people. You've heard the stat, if we cut our grain-fed beef consumption by 10%, we could end world hunger. So, two major habits we've exported to the developing world, driving a lot of cars and eating a lot of meat. And I would not be surprised if big oil and big beef had something to do with the current confusion over biofuels. Now, trading food for energy is not a long-term solution, but it's a technological step towards making fuel out of all kinds of shit, literally. And it sure as hell beats pumping more CO2 out of the bloody tar sands. That is my opinion. Do you work from home and are looking for a different way to get work done? Co-working has made its way to Montreal, and the trend is catching on fast with the city's entrepreneurs. Kristina Kozakiewicz brings us a story. You've heard of co-workers, but what about co-working? It's a trend that's moving independent professionals out of the house and into a shared working environment. Freelance journalists, web designers, and other entrepreneurs like Harry Rakitomalala have come to work in Montreal's first co-working space. I come here often instead of uh, going to a coffee shop or working at home because um, I find I get work done. Um, more easily, more quickly. It's more <laughs> professional than going to, uh, say, uh, a Starbucks or a second cup. This co-working trend started out on the west coast of the United States, the idea being a cafe-like community, but without all the noise and distractions. For $300 per month, Montreal Station C provides a kitchen, a conference room, workstations, and all in a trendy atmosphere. But Patrick Tongay, a co-founder of Station C, says, it's more than just an office space. In our case, it's really it's an open space and people are there to find a place to work and uh, share meeting rooms and printer and everything, but also to uh, work with other freelancers in the same space and find collaborators and build projects together. For Concordia News, I'm Christina Kozikiewicz. Montreal's southwest neighborhood of Griffintown is set for major redevelopment in the next few years. But the area's residents wonder if there will be a place for them in the new neighborhood. Vanessa Lundgren reports. Used bike shop Velomacac has been selling some of the city's most affordable bikes for the past six years. It's one of several businesses in Griffintown that will be pushed out by pending construction plans. Owner Jean Fort has been told he'll have to move out by 2009. My site's going to be demolished and you're supposedly going to do condos, so they're going to wide it out. and. Uh, so I for sure did not demolish all my building. It already affects my business because it makes me stress a lot, you know, it makes me think of later what I'm supposed to do, what I should do. For now, his business is in limbo. Fort has chosen to hold off stocking more bikes in his shop. Private developer Devimco will replace these rundown buildings with modern condos, hotels and a mall, as this architectural drawing shows. Empty lots like this one are exactly what Devimco plans to develop. The $1.3 billion project will turn this semi-industrial section of town into a residential and commercial centre. But not only business owners are unhappy about development plans. Artists have long been drawn to Griffin Town due to cheap rent and spacious lofts. Musician Philip Clark lives and works in the area. Just, I just wouldn't want it to turn into like a sort of cookie cutter thing that you can see in any city around the world, you know. Same stores, same chains. and same kind of boring 
condo buildings and stuff. If construction goes according to schedule, today's Griffin Town will be no more by 2019. For Concordia News, I'm Vanessa Lundgren. You've probably heard of hallucinogens like LSD and mushrooms, but now a new drug is growing in popularity in Montreal and there are some concerns about its safety. Isabel Godfra has the story. This is a bag of salvia. It is a hallucinogenic substance that is often smoked in shishu pipes like these. Over at the Café Le Monteur on Montréal Street, salvia is on the menu. The owner, Matthew Lipscomb, says since he started selling salvia, business is booming. Like this business is working now after three weeks. Two, after two weeks it worked, like full, like making tons of money. The café opened last January and Lipscomb already decided to double the prices. Portions are sold in individual tubes like this. Their price was $10, now it is 20 However, some countries, like Australia and Italy, have already banned salvia. In the US, it is on the list of drugs of concern. Canada has not regulated it yet. Gabriela Zabo is health coordinator at Concordia Health Services. She says salvia has not been regulated because of lack of data. Uh, so there was a handful in the end of relevant articles that reviewed the substance, reviewed the effects of the substance, the experience of users and so forth. She also warns the hallucinogenic effects of salvia are comparable to those of LSD and mushrooms. Even Lipscomb admits that some of his customers have reacted strongly to salvia. And he started freaking out and wanted to run out the door to go save his mom from something. Oh, and he was screaming like a madman, like, it was really bad. Still, Lipscomb says his cafe will continue selling salvia until the substance is regulated. For Concordia News, this is Isabel Godfoy. Being green is in fashion, and now it seems as though fashion is turning green. A new wave of eco-designers are tailoring the Montreal scene with their green designs. Veronica Islas has the story. The color is not the only green thing about this shirt. Blank, the company that made it, uses environmentally friendly dyes and their whole production process is based in Montreal. This means less transportation and less fossil fuel consumption. Blank's owner and designer, Martin Delisle, says this is good news for the environment. The fact that everything is made here, like I said, no boat, no uh, containers, no, nothing in transportation are involved. So that's why uh, after some research on blank, they realized that we were two to three times more eco-friendly than the majority of our um, competitors. So why should you buy an eco-friendly shirt and not a regular one? If this shirt was made in China, it would travel 25,000 miles before hitting your favorite stores rack. By buying an eco-friendly t-shirt, like this one, not only are you promoting the local economy, you're also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Green fashion is also hitting Quebec's catwalks. Fashion designers have different ways to green their creations. These clothes, showcased during Montreal Fashion Week, were created by Miko Anna, a Quebec eco-designer. We recycle clothes, so each piece is made from 20 to 100 percent of recycled materials. We also use commercial balance, so rejects from big uh, commercial uh, companies. Back at Blank, the little warns about companies pretending to be green to profit from the eco trend. So let's pretend that it's eco, and everybody's like, "Wow, let's buy it, even if it's twice the price." Even if eco-friendly clothes are sometimes more pricey. That extra buck could save the planet. For Concordia News, I'm Veronica Islas. Spring is in the air in Montreal, and it's about time. Reporter Christy Elizabeth is patrolling Loyola campus to see how students are enjoying the sunshine. Montrealers have suffered more than usual this year at the hands of Jack Frost. Just a few days ago, we were all cowering over our baseboard heaters in a puddle of our own tears as yet another blizzard crushed our spirits. Today, however, the air is abuzz with surprise and relief that Montreal has finally hit the double digits we so richly deserve. So it's right in time for exams. Let's see how it affects student study habits. <laughs> I'm trying to stay inside the library as much as possible, but I mean, it's hard with everyone just hanging outside. So. Okay. Yesterday, I studied outside on the patio uh, next to the snow. Definitely much harder to study. When you see people outside and the sun shining, you don't want to be inside reading. Well, it's only been sunny for the past uh, couple of days, so I've been inside studying the whole time. So, there you have it. It looks like Concordia students remain studious, rain or shine. For Concordia Journalism, I'm Christy Elizabeth.
And that's all for this hour. For Concordia News, I'm Christina Kozakiewicz. And I'm Chris McLean. Have a great day.